Come on in. Let's get ready. If we could close the sanctuary doors. Jesus loves it when you come to be intimate with him and you close every other door behind you to come be with him. Prepare your hearts. Everybody in conversation, if you could wrap it up, we're ready to worship. We're ready to worship. Good news is after we get to know Jesus a little better today, you get to know one another if you want. Stick around in fellowship. As we worship today, I feel like just as a prophetic, as a prophetic act, I invite you to stand with me. And we're going to sit back down. Just stand with me in this moment of prophetic act. We're going to shut the doors behind us. All right? And on the count of three, I just want you to turn around like this. Every door of distraction, every door of every other desire that's not him and stronghold enemies. I mean, just we, we shut the door and this is a secret place. This is a place of intimacy today. This is a place of closeness with God. I feel like today I'm sitting down today. Iris is sitting down. You usually sit down anyways, right? <laughs> I feel like today in our worship, it's a special place of intimacy available. I feel like the floor is going to be a lot of your best friend. For, for many of you, your best friend is going to be the floor. And to sit with him today and to lavish your love on him and to allow him to lavish his love on you and to maybe come up and just sit on the floor and adore him today and to kneel and to, and to prostrate yourself. When's the last time you heard that word? When's the last time you experienced the anointing that comes when you fall face down before the king? There's a special gift today the Lord wants to pour out on us. It's a touch. It's a touch of amazing, amazing love and intimacy. So please, in this sanctuary, you can be seated. I'm going to read a, a scripture. After I read this scripture and we go into worship, you are more than welcome to go anywhere in this sanctuary and come up to the sides or the altar, kneel, stand, sit, and be with the Lord in, in an intimate way that you and the Holy Spirit decide what that looks like today. Now when Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came up to him with an alabaster flask of very expensive ointment, and she poured it on his head as he reclined at the table. And when the disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, Why this waste? For this could have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. In pouring out this ointment on my body, she has done it to prepare me for burial. Truly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed, in the whole world, even in 2023 in Boise, Idaho, right here in Zion Church on this Sunday, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. And I want to encourage every one of us, out of honor for the Lord, within the context of this story, that we would do the same today. That we'd break our jar of worship and that we'd love him because is he not worthy of it? What, what do we come here for if not to show honor to him? What are we here for if not to break open our hearts and pour out with all that we have our praise to him? What a privilege. What an invitation. So I just invite you now to Assume a posture of worship, whether that's standing or kneeling. I pray that whatever physical posture you're in, your heart would be engaged today. Lord, we honor you today. We love you. We love you. We're eager to know you today. We're excited about the salvation of the Lord that is in this house. We're excited about the reality of being overwhelmed by your faithfulness this morning. 
I don't even think we've scratched the surface of how good you really are. We're excited that in this exchange of love, this roaring of a waterfall that's crying out to another waterfall, in this praise and worship, we will experience the kingdom of God this morning, which is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. We worship you in the reality of the cross, in the victory of the cross, in the victory of the resurrection. Let there be righteousness that reigns in our midst today. Let there be peace that reigns in our midst today as you bring deliverance to anything and everyone that needs it. Lord, have your way in this house today. Lord, be the guest of honor. Shepherd our hearts in this time of worship. We love you. We love you. We just want to be ourselves in your presence. No performance today. No performance today. No entertainment today. Just the pure love of the bride breaking her jar of adoration on the head of the king today. Let the oil of your presence fill this room today, Lord, as we pour ours out for you and give you the honor and the praise that's due only to you. Jesus, be glorified today.
your song to and cry home.
must have more of you Oh, I must have more of you What else is there to live for? I must have more of you Oh, there's nothing else out there that makes me feel the way you do
without any instruments just worship the Lord just worship him in the beauty in the beauty of his holiness in the glory of his presence
Jesus be. Jesus be. matters but giving him glory
ever stop from giving you attention. attention. Who is like you, Lord? Nothing and no one in all the earth compares to you. You're the treasure.
on your heart and break that yoke that he never put there it wasn't from him oh, the anointing breaks the yoke child in this place blessed Lord blessed with your anointing every youth in this place blessed Lord blessed with your anointing every grown man every grown woman in this place blessed with the anointing of your presence Lord we are so grateful that in the face of uncertain times that you are our certainty that we have no fear because we know you and I just want to say I've talked with other people about survival and getting ready you know stocking up on water and canned goods and and uh, you know toilet paper <laughs> I thought toilet paper but you know what there's one thing that will cause you to be totally secure in these days. I want you to make a note of this. I want you to write it down in your mind. This is the one thing that will keep you safe and secure. That is the ability to hear God. If you can hear God, you will be just fine because he will always tell you what to do. And guess what the children are learning how to do in our Sunday school lessons? They are learning, if the curriculum is learning how to hear God. And so boys and girls, will you come up right now and I'm gonna pray over you and I'm just gonna cause the Lord to anoint your ears today in a new way. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that it's not just for us Anointing, Lord, that are older, case. but it is Fire for the these Spirit darling little children that you are training up in the way that they should go. Lord, I'm asking in Jesus' name, that you would touch each one of these little ones. Lord, that they would have their ears opened, that they could hear the voice of the Lord. Lord, we ask your anointing on these Sunday school lessons where they are being trained to hear God. And so Lord, we thank you that with the training comes the anointing. And so we're declaring that over every single one of our children, that they will hear God and that they will be secure and they will be fearless in the days that we are living. In Jesus' name. All right, boys and girls, go, go forward and get those lessons in your heart, okay? Jesus. just going to take a moment. We're going to let the parents get their children checked in and come back before we transition. But we just invite you to continue to rest in the Lord, get to know one another, greet one another in the Lord. Oh, there is freedom. Oh, there is freedom. There is freedom. You make me come alive. Oh, you make me come alive. You make me come alive. that slide up for just a second. Did we not just have 
the sweetest time of worship. I mean, God's habitation. It's not just this building. It's not just Zion. We are God's habitation. And just to feel him tangibly. I don't know if you guys did. I sure did. Man, I have a testimony for you in a minute, but I've got to take care of business first. <laughs> so as you can see, it's a really lovely day. Fall day in Idaho. Our um, family fellowship feast is canceled because we didn't think anybody wanted to sit out in the rain. But the good news is, if you were planning on it, find somebody, hook up, go have lunch. We did. <laughs> so uh, just create your own fellowship. Go have lunch. There's lots of great restaurants around here, downtown. Um, enjoy some food and fellowship. Get to know some people. That's the whole idea behind our, our get-togethers like that. Um, I've got a lot of but I'm not going to do them because I want to get to my testimony and I'm told I have about that much time for announcements. So um, we do have a church. Uh, first of all, I want to welcome our first time guests. If this is your first time, welcome, welcome. We're so excited to have you. If you could just raise your hand. We have a little goodie bag for you. Ushers, I don't know where they went to, but we do have a goodie bag for you. Inside that bag, there's little pieces of candy, so open it up, <laughs> and, um, and a Connect card. If you could fill out that Connect card so we can get to know you, let us know if there's any way that we could pray for you. Um, Dave, right up here in the front, too. Thanks. Oh. <clears throat> Anyway, uh, we would love to pray for you, get to know you a little bit. So fill out that Connect card. Uh, you can put it in the black box in the back. That would be great. Um, again, lots of announcements. We have a Church Center app. We put all of our announcements, our calendar, uh, all sorts of stuff on there. So if you want to get to know what's happening here, we've got lots of stuff during the week to uh, create community for you to bond with other believers and to grow in the Lord. So... Um, Go ahead and check out that. Um, also, we have our YouTube channel. If um, you loved what you heard today, even if you didn't, we have a YouTube channel. Go on there, press in. You'll find something that you like. Pastor Zach has a message on there um, just about the heart of Zion and what we believe and uh, why we're here in this valley. So check that out. Um, again, we have lots of stuff throughout the week, so check out our our church center app. Uh, we are super excited this fall. We've got lots of exciting things going on, but we have a Holy Spirit conference with David Hogan. Super excited. I don't know if you guys know anything about him. Uh, Pastor has said, don't go watch anything, but I didn't listen. I did. <laughs> you don't want to miss it. You do not want to miss it. That is uh, November 29th and 30th, starting at 6 p.m. And we need your help. We want you to come. We don't want you to miss out, but we need your help. We, um, I have a volunteer sign up in the back. We need help in areas. So, uh, if you would like to volunteer for that, go ahead and sign up. Next week, we're going to have um, a registration just so we can get an idea of how many people are going to be here. Uh, but I encourage you to definitely um, mark your calendars for that. Change your plans. If you have plans for something, this is it. I'm telling you. Right. If you do volunteer in any area, um, we do have the children's and stuff, but a lot of the other volunteer stuff is up here. It is for two nights. So if you do volunteer on one night, um, you can be here for the other night. Um, but if you want to volunteer for both, that'd be great. Good. Um, also, we have other opportunities to serve here in the church. It's not just for David Hogan. Um, we love our kids. You saw how many we have up here. We do have need in that area for ushers and greeters and um, all sorts of areas. So uh, go ahead and fill out a card if you'd like to or connect with me after the service. I'd love to talk to you. Um, so something the Lord has put on my heart, um, not just on my heart, I've experienced this like real time, um, just the joy, the peace, and the faithfulness of God. Um, my husband and I have had a lot going on in our lives lately, and I don't need to get too deep with you guys, but we have a business out of town. Uh, we're remodeling our home and having to move out and um, lots of other things, but everything hit like 
all at once, literally within a three day span. And um, it was tough. But you know, I get up every morning and I have my quiet time with the Lord. Sometimes I can have extended time because I have the time and other times it's just a few minutes. But I am faithful in that because he is my sustainer. He is the one who gets me through every day. And I wrote some things down because I didn't want to forget. Um, so because he is my stainer, sustainer, I'm faithful to him. And not just because of that, but he loves me. And you know, all the chaos and stuff going on in this world, sometimes we don't feel very loved by our friends, our spouse, our family, our kids. But he loves us no matter what. And feeling it, it's just outstanding. Um, so throughout all this crazy time, my husband and I had to leave and go to our business, and we were gone for a month. And again, all the chaos and stuff surrounding, I was still faithful with my quiet time in the morning, but it turned into be just a short amount of time because I didn't have a lot of time. And so we're going through all this stuff, and one morning when we were down, Texas is where our business is, we were down in Texas, and I was sitting there and I had my quiet time and I just started weeping. I, well, first of all, I grabbed my Bible and I said, Lord, what do you want me to read today? And I just started weeping. I was overwhelmed with his goodness and the joy in my life, even in the midst of all this crazy stuff going on because I was giving to him. And you know what? Not, let me just rewind that, scratch that. Not because I was faithful to him, because he is faithful to me, I was sustained. And I thought back over the course of the last few weeks um, and just overwhelmed by his, just his quiet presence in my life. Some of these songs we were singing, I just, I just couldn't even help it. I just, I don't, there's no words for it. If you've experienced, you know, there's just no words for it. Just his sustaining grace and his power. And um, the word says in Matthew 6, it's very familiar, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. He will sustain you. Um, so as we take this opportunity to give of our time here at the church, our finances, our energy, our worship. We need to remember James 1.17. Every good and perfect gift comes from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. You know, God's economy doesn't change. He doesn't change. Nat natural circumstances will not change his love and faithfulness toward us, his thoughts toward us. His ways are higher than our ways. And they're not ruled on emotions. Sometimes ours are. A lot of times ours are. <laughs> but he is our joy, and he is our sustainer. And our authentic generosity in all areas of life comes out of a place of obedience and gratitude and faithfulness. And boy, has this been so much greater and more relevant in my life lately. So I just encourage you, out of your heart, out of your circumstance, be faithful to him. And like um, Marcia said, you know, being able to hear the voice of God is what is going to get you through. And that's absolutely true. So if you are going to give financially today, there's an envelope in the back of your seat. You can give in the black box in the back uh, on our church app. I push that all the time, our church center app. Uh, so let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for your gift of love, for your gift of Jesus. God, you are our sustainer. You are our provider. You are our eyes and ears. And when we submit to you, Lord God, we have perfect peace. We just honor you today. Let our hearts and our minds and our ears be open to what it is that you would say to us today. We honor you, Holy Spirit. And we open up to you whatever you would do or say here today. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ. Thank you for the cross. Thank you that in our place, instead, he suffered. And he suffered well, and he suffered faithfully. So that we ourselves could be saved, delivered and healed through his death on the cross. Thank you, Father. We renounce self-dependence today. We renounce our own strength for whatever we think it is. It's, it's nothing. We are in a war. And we have nothing to contribute on the battleground if we are not armored and arrayed with the weapons of heaven. And we thank you that none of us have to be caught out there naked and ashamed, but that we can all be clothed in the righteousness of Jesus in these days, filled with the Spirit, overflowing with heaven's anointing, heaven's perspective, heaven's fruit in the Holy Spirit, wisdom and revelations through our minds in the knowledge of Jesus. We delight ourselves in you today, Lord. We confess our need and dependence upon you today. You are the Lord. And if we allow it, if we perceive it by faith, your strength is our strength. The salvation you opened up is our salvation. The authority you give to your followers is our authority. We love you. We delight ourselves in you today. Holy Spirit, I acknowledge your presence in the room today. Holy Spirit, do what only you can do. Touch what only you can touch. Open up what only you can open. Holy Spirit, have your way. We come with our Bibles. We come with our hunger. And we come with our ears. And we come with our hearts. And we say, we're ready, Lord. Speak to us. We are listening. We are listening. And Lord, I pray that as we hear the written word today, we would also encounter the revelatory word through the person of the Holy Spirit in our midst so that we would know you, so that we would know you. Oh, Holy Spirit, have your way in this time. Above all things, just make sure Jesus gets really, really exalted and the rest will be okay. We give our hearts to you in Jesus' name. Amen. I have a message prepared for today that I want to talk about. But then there's some other stuff I really want to talk about, such as warfare and the battle that we're in and the reality of a devil who hates you and wants to wear you out. He wants to wear you out. And the reality of a king who actually has that devil's head. Satan, your head is under Jesus' feet. Christ is the head. I heard Bill Johnson say this recently. Satan is not under the chin. Who's the body of Christ? So whose feet is he under? As we're connected to the head, we have authority 
on this earth to bind and to loose. We have authority and dominion in the Lord through our intimacy with him, through our connection with the head as we receive the blood flow and the revelation and the strength and everything we need from the head. We get to trample upon the enemy. Listen, everything you need in this life can be found in Christ. Everything. Everything, 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 everything you need, if you will root yourself in the house of God, if you will plug in, if you will position yourself, the Bible says, if those who position themselves in the house of God are like a plant by the streams of water that flourishes or like an olive tree. If you give yourself to him, he will give you everything he created you for. He will give you everything That you need so that in all situations, in all seasons, at all times, having abundantly more than enough of supply of heaven, everything you need will be at your disposal to get through whatever the enemy who's under your feet is throwing your way to try to wear you down. I'm going to stop with spiritual warfare here in a second. Through intimacy, through the knowledge of who Jesus is and how powerful he really is and how good he really is, you can be under assault or you can be afflicted or you can be in trials and tribulations. You you can be suffering. And in one moment, the revelation of his goodness and his power can overwhelm your soul and in that moment you can feast and have a meal in the presence of your enemies. You guys know what I'm talking about? You ever ever been in a moment, you ever been in a moment of such spiritual warfare that the religious side of you tells you to speak in tongues and declare and get all the scripture memorized and and do all the stuff and just wear yourself out? I'm not saying that's always the religious spirit, but here, here, there's a whole nother level of glory. The word of God says we go from glory to glory. You can be in the middle of spiritual warfare doing all that you can muster in your own strength. And then you get this revelation that like the king is in the room and he's really good and he's really powerful. And in the most intense moment, the intense moment of your spiritual warfare, all of a sudden you can be overwhelmed with joy and break out in intense laughter. Woo! I've encountered darkness before where my initial reaction was to get a little intimidated, to respond out of fear. And then, in an instant, to make room for the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit does this. He will show you the reality of the supremacy of Christ over and against what you are facing. And in that moment, you'll be reminded, your soul will be reminded who's won the war, who's won the battle. And in that moment, you can laugh. In that moment, you can rejoice and give thanks for today is the day of salvation. I will delight myself in the Lord. Today is the day to rejoice in the Lord. I've commanded my soul to rejoice in the Lord. And you can have these moments of intense warfare. At the same time, being overwhelmed with the pleasure of Jesus. You know, Jesus told me something this week. He said, I'm really good at what I do. Rest in me. Like, I'm, I'm really good at what I do. Sickness? Oh, watch, watch how I can handle sickness. A broken marriage? Just, just shut your mouth and let me take over from here. Okay, I'm, I'm ruining my marriage with this thing. I'm going to do it Jesus' way now. Be quiet. I'm really good at restoring marriage, as the Lord says. Submit yourself to me. Submit yourself to me. And resist the evil one. Submit yourself to me. Resist the evil one. Jesus is really good at what he does. Torment, darkness, bondage. Man, he's got the strength to overthrow everything we're suffering from that's not of him. He is so good. He's so much better than we're aware of. There is nothing that you've been through that he cannot heal you from. Nothing. Nothing. 
Through the power of the cross, every assault of the enemy can be absorbed in him. And you can put on your back what's called his yoke, his burden, which alleviates you from every other yoke and every other burden. And his burden is light, right? The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. That's, that's the yoke he wants to put on your life. He wants it to become normal Christianity for you to experience overwhelming peace and joy and the power of righteousness in your everyday. So don't, don't be intimidated. Listen, it is time for the body of Christ to be way more overwhelmed by the might of the God they worship rather than the power of the enemy they've been running from. It's time to be overwhelmed by the power and goodness of God. It's time to pray unto the Lord like priests and kings who are subduing territory on behalf of heaven through the power of the Holy Spirit. Will you put that picture up, Kevin, of the sanctuary, please? I thought about this. I think this is maybe a word for somebody. Um, that's our sanctuary. When we tore this building apart, this was an old dentist office, and the ceiling, the ceiling was right there where that line is, where the wall meets the ceiling. The ceiling was all the way, boom, right here, so my head would be touching. And we did what's called in construction, sistering where you come into an existing truss with a new one and we put vaulted trusses right up against the existing trusses and we secured or we sistered the new truss into the old truss and then we cut out the bottom of the existing truss that now didn't belong anymore. But before we could cut out that portion, we had to sister it with a new engineered truss and I this is what I feel. I feel like maybe, maybe this is a, just a word for the church and for all of us. But if this is for you, just say, I re, I, after this, if it applies, receive it. But I feel like some of us are like that trust. We have an existing structure that's low, and it needs to change. It needs to shift. And the Holy Spirit in and alongside you is sistering your soul and then cutting out what needs to get elevated and needs to get pushed up. It, it, he wants to take the roof off your spiritual life. He wants to increase your capacity to love him. He wants to strengthen the fervor and the zeal in which you serve him. He wants to rise up in you with a desperation for his presence that maybe you come to church a little earlier than you've been coming because you're hungry for him. Maybe you, maybe you haven't ran into your prayer closet in a while, and maybe he's going to cut some stuff out and break that ceiling open and increase the awareness of himself in you, and you start running into the secret place again. I pray an anointing of the Lord to come alongside you, to sister into what is existing for the purpose of cutting out what's too low and needs to be removed so that he can elevate so that he can elevate your function in Christ. We go from glory to glory. The, the ceiling never gets lower in Christianity. We go from glory to glory to glory until one day he comes back and returns and he burns down and blows apart every ceiling we've ever made and we realize that in heaven there might not be any ceilings anymore. For the glory of the Lord is there. Holy Spirit, help me today. I don't want to speak anything outside of the authority of your presence. You're so good. Tend to us like a garden today. Cause us to flourish. Uproot what doesn't belong. Speak, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Stand with me. I want to read a scripture.
Psalm 132, verses 13 through 18. How many of you are hungry for the word of God? Hungry for the word. The word of God is supernatural. The word of God can heal you. It's amazing. You allow your life to be consumed by the word, you'll find things getting healed all over the place. Psalm 132, 13 through 18. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling place. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell for I have desired it. I will abundantly bless her provisions. I will satisfy her poor with bread. Her priests I will clothe with salvation and her saints will shout for joy. There I will make a horn to sprout for David. I have prepared a lamp for my anointed. His enemies I will clothe with shame. But on him, his crown will shine. In Jesus' name, you may be seated. The only role that shame has in your life is to be the clothing that your enemies wear. If you're going to allow shame and tolerate shame in your life, make sure it's what your enemy is wearing. Make sure your soul is reminded of the cleansing blood of Jesus and now he's clothed you in garments of righteousness and praise. The pulse of Zion. Oh, geez, there's so much I want to say. Lord, help me, help me, help me. Help me be here. Help me be totally present here. Help me. I want to, honestly, guys, I just want to float away in, in the overwhelming presence of God right now. I could worship with you guys all day long. I, I, I in one sense... I could, I could speak nothing good to you today because all I'm thinking about is falling more in love with Jesus. Yeah. And in another sense, I have to rely on his mercy today to maybe, to maybe plant some good seeds of revelation and wisdom and knowledge of Jesus that prosper in your heart and that grow in you. Let me just say this. This church is different. This church is different. And, and our team is not in a hurry to conform. Our, term is, our, our church is not in a hurry to mimic anything other than Jesus. Our, our, our textbook that we glean insight from for a church model is the book of Acts. And even though that's our goal, I could still say to you today, oh, we're so far. Like from what they experienced in that early church. But, but not to be discouraged, not to put us down and say, oh, we're Zion, we're, t we're titled Zion. Yeah, we call ourselves Zion. That's a big name to put on yourself. And yet here's the book of Acts, and Lord, we, we want to function in the reality that they functioned in, in the book of Acts. And any, any distance, any stronghold between us and that, we want you to deal with. And that's why last week we preached on, Lord, clean this house. Lord, cleanse the temple. If there's any way we've made this house of prayer, a house of merchandise, a house of the systems of man and the fear of man instead of the fear of God, oh, Jesus, cleanse this place. And of course, there's, there's always cleaning work the Lord is doing in our lives, right? Yes. Even as he's called us to be perfect and, and he's perfecting us through the process of sanctification, we're becoming more like him. He's always working but there's no shame and condemnation. This was one of my concerns in starting the churches. How, if it doesn't quite look like the book of Acts right away, or there's all this stuff that's got to figure out, how am I going to stay secure and safe from the overwhelming burden or shame or condemnation of it not looking like it needs to be? I don't want to steward that thing. I'm out. Pick another minister of the gospel. Choose somebody else. I'm just going to run my business, stay quiet, live a humble Christian life, and keep my head low. You know the Lord is calling you to things. The Lord is calling you to things that the enemy is trying to terrify you of. The enemy wants to make you feel as though you can never live up to or achieve the calling that God has on your life. And here's the good news. Here's, here's, what you get, here's, here's how you get to refute that and combat that when the enemy makes you intimidated of the things of God. 
you admit it. You say, well, of, of course, I'm incapable of achieving the things of God in my own strength. But guess what? He has not called us into anything that he will not accompany us in and strengthen us for. And as long as you stay low, prostrated on the ground, humbled on your knees, on your face, as long as you acknowledge who he is, he will strengthen you for every purpose and plan he has for your life. Because the Lord is your strength. And we get to fall on our faces and say, Holy Spirit, have your way in this place. This church is a little different. We're learning. We're growing. I want to talk to you a little bit about the dynamics of this house. Many of you, some of this stuff might be familiar, but if you're new or you've been coming recently, it's good for you to be aware of what you are choosing to get into. I heard Bill Johnson say elsewhere, I'm I'm giving a lot of glory to Bill Johnson today. Cool. I love him. He's an amazing teacher. In one of their early meetings, they were talking about how to grow a big church. Bill Johnson just stayed quiet throughout the whole meeting. Bill, what do you think? What's your strategy? What's your plan? He's like, I don't want to grow a big church. I don't want to build a big church. I want to build big people. And that's really similar to how we feel in this place. Our our goal, our goal is to come and be transformed and sanctified by the presence and the power of the Lord so that we can get so possessed with heaven that if there's a hundred of us in this place, heaven is getting released and manifested through a hundred people. Our, Our goal in this house is not to get big and flashy and showy, so please know that. You, you, you engaged in some precious worship today that was not showy. We, we cried out today. Amen. We cried out for the Lord today. Amen. I don't know about you, but that's what I felt. That, the, the power of crying out to Jesus overwhelmed my soul today. And I thought to myself in a moment, I said, Jesus, I am honored to be in a congregation of people that cry out for you. This is real worship. This is real worship. I'm, losing, I'm willing to lose my voice every Sunday for the sake of crying out. And I don't know how it happens because I, I do not do any of the vocal warm-ups that I used to do when I was in performance vocals. I don't do anything my choir teacher used to tell me. And I just say, Lord, I don't have time for that anymore. I'm raising kids and running this and running that. I ain't got time. I just, I'm going to open up my mouth and sing. I'm trusting you're going to be there for me. Every Sunday, I feel like I lose my voice. And science will tell you, you do that enough, you're going to lose your voice. Or you won't be ready to sing within the next six days. And every Sunday, supernaturally, it comes back. It's like, boom, there's my cry. There's my cry. Come on, when you lose yourself in worship unto the Lord, everything weak in you will be made strong. Is this talking to anybody? Get wild for him. Get, get a little unreserved for him. You know? Lose yourself for his sake. Pray for me, please. I could go so many different directions today. Pray for me. The value of this place in God's eyes, the value of this place is determined because he loves us. And he has appraised this church with a very high value. I'm speaking about us today. I'm speaking about our family. I'm speaking about this sanctuary that for me still feels like the original living room where we started this church. It still feels like that. Still feels like we're sitting on couches and sitting on the floor and the back doors open to the patio and people are on the patio and it it still feels like a holy, holy living room to me. And the value of this place has been and always will be his love and his presence. And his presence defines what this place looks like and what we experience here. I want to read you something I wrote on Tuesday. I recently imagined in my spirit, it was on Tuesday, I imagined in my spirit an angel of the Lord with a stethoscope 
around his neck on assignment to take the pulse of all the gatherings that claim the name of Jesus on the earth today. I saw it. I won't call it a vision from God. I perceived this in my sanctified imagination as I was studying this psalm. Saw the angel on assignment roaming the earth with a stethoscope to take the pulse of every gathering. And here's the good thing. Here's the good thing about the angel of the Lord taking a pulse of a gathering and finding out there's no pulse. He's not there to condemn and destroy that gathering. He's there to do what happened in Ezekiel 37 and by the Spirit of the Lord breathe life into those bones. We pray revival over every congregation. We're not here to compare to other congregations. We're here to say, Lord, have mercy upon every gathering, claiming the name of Jesus in our Christian family so that everybody can have a pulse. Because where there's the pulse, there's power. There's power. And listen, that pulse plays out in the power to heal, the power to carry salvation, the power to deliver people from oppression, and also the power to be steadfast and to persevere and to love. Some power is in the moment, and it's supernatural, and it manifests. Some power is over time, and it manifests gradually. Do you know there's an anointing on the, of the Lord on your life to not just release signs and wonders and miracles, but to endure? The anointing of the Lord is no less strong when it comes to suffering long alongside somebody and watching as healing unfolds, even though in all your spiritual muster and strength, you're like, now, 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 and it's not happening now, and the Lord's like, I could do it now, but your character won't develop. I could do it now, and you could be so anointed and fill stadiums and see all this stuff and go home and have zero character, and I won't be honored. I don't get all that fully. I, I, I study the anointing. I study to learn about how Jesus moves in these days, and I don't get it all. I don't get it all. I've seen some stuff just happen. And then I've seen other stuff not just happen and take a month or six months or a year. Or I'm still waiting for that thing to shift. But you know what's happening? You're getting stronger. You're getting refined. Jesus is sifting through your unbelief. Jesus is causing your faith to increase to the size of a mustard seed. The angel was taking pulses. Is it weak? Is it strong? Is it reminiscent of the original heartbeat between God and man in the untainted Garden of Eden? In the spirit, the pulse says everything. It's the heartbeat. It's the rhythm that can be interpreted to assess the life or absence of life in a body. The angel was then to return to the Lord with a report of the gatherings that were found dead and those that were found alive. There was one chief difference. The dead gatherings were of those who simply pronounced the name of Jesus. The alive gatherings were of those who pronounced the name of Jesus and who fell prostrate before Jesus and adored him. Adoration has everything to do with whether or not the pulse of Jesus is in this place. Part of the DNA of this house, when the Lord said to start this place, he said, you're not building a stage, you're building an altar. Amen. And an altar has fire, an altar has a pulse, and an altar gives space and room and time for my people to adore me so that I can be the guest of honor in their midst. This is a place not just to speak the name of Jesus and then not give Jesus the time of day. This is the place to speak of Jesus and fall down on our faces and worship Jesus. And I'm telling you, it's the safest place to be in these last days. You want to be safe? You want to be secure? Do you want to be joyful? Get down and worship him. Adore him. Love him with everything that's inside of you. 
And I'm telling you, 90% of your battles will be dealt with without you doing a thing. When you give yourself to him, he fights for you. To the former church, he was just a religious leader. But to the latter, he was Lord and friend. To the former church or gathering, the Bible was to be read. But to the latter, the Bible was to be eaten and consumed as a meal. The former spoke of him, but the latter depended on him and waited for him. To the former, Christ was a subject to be studied and controlled theologically. But to the latter, Christ was the manna from heaven by which the ones consuming him cried out in spiritual hunger and desperation and said, more of you, Jesus, more of you, Jesus, more of you, Jesus, more of you, Jesus. Are we hearing this? Do you want to know about Jesus or do you want to feast on him? Worship at an altar versus worship at a stage means that you conform to the one you worship. He doesn't conform to you. God is not going to obey our systems and our time restraints. He could care less about all that. He'll be patient with us while we figure that out. But if this is an altar instead of a stage in this house, then we conform to him. I take refuge in knowing that I do not worship a God who conforms to me. Oh, how depressing to worship and build a religion based on your perspective. No, we worship a God at this altar who says, go, stay, do this, up, down, listen, whatever. Lord, okay. We conform to him. He defines us. We don't define God. We, we don't get to sit around a theological ta- table and define God and speak for him. Nobody has a right to speak for God who has not allowed God to speak for himself in their own life. Jesus, until I know you and until I've given your voice authority, don't let me open my mouth. This, this place is precious to him. You are precious to him. The angel was taking the pulse of all these gatherings. And another question the angel was asking himself as he returned unto the Lord. Once again, this was just a vision I had in my imagination on Tuesday as the angel returned to the Lord. One question he asked was, is there a reflection of Jesus in that gathering? Can Christ see himself in our midst? Is his cross in this place? Is the self-denied life in this place? Is, Is I love you more than I love myself in this place? Is the cross in this place? I can tell you this. If the cross is in this place, the glory of the resurrection and the power of Jesus will be in this place. His power accompanies love. His power accompanies humility. His power accompanies faithfulness and servanthood. I want to give you some things to chew on. How is Zion defined? What makes Zion special? And I'm, hear me now. In one sense, I'm, I'm talking about this physical church. I'm talking about us. But in another sense, Zion is so much bigger than us. Zion is, is, is the place where the Lord dwells amidst his people all throughout the earth. We're going to see something special about Zion here, number one. I want to I give this to you. Zion's pulse is provoked by who it houses. In this place, do we house the opinions of man or the opinions of God? 
Do we house the fear of man or the fear of God? Do we house the wisdom of culture and news and, or do we house the word of God? Is our sustenance defined by him? I believe it is. I believe it is. Zion's pulse is provoked by who it houses. What gives life to Zion is the fact that he dwells there. Remove his presence and Zion's just a name. Zion's just a shell without a pulse. And maybe on the outside, it looks like a good social movement and cultural movement and it's doing good stuff, but if God is not there, honored in purity and holiness and reverence for the absolute infallibility and authority of the word of God and the existence of Christ the King, the Lord of Lords, and what he says goes, it doesn't matter how much poor people we feed or how much social injustice we take care of, if we're not honoring him, he's not in our midst and there's no pulse. And our good works will be consumed and tested for what they truly are, absent of the Lord's authority and glory. In another sense, we're, we're not to get so caught up in the glory of the Lord that we forget about the culture we live in and abandon our neighbors. But can I tell you this? If we're truly enraptured with the presence of Jesus, we'll overflow out there. A drop of water he gives to us will become a spring of water to them. Listen to this. Adam was just a body until the breath of the Lord filled his nostrils and he became a living being in Genesis 2-7. He became a living being when the breath of the Lord breathed into him. So too, perhaps the church is just a form with no divine function until Jesus is acknowledged and given dominion. This is fascinating to me. If you look up the word Zion in the Old Testament where it originated, it doesn't mean something beautiful. It means parched place. It means dry, arid, parched place. That's what Zion means. There's, there's nothing fabulous or fascinating about Zion other than it's a parched place that has no glory because without him, it's desolate, and there's nothing beautiful about Zion other than the fact that God occupies her. Jesus, out in the desert in a parched place, 40 days. 40 nights, redeeming Zion's identity. Redeeming, redeeming, redeeming. Fighting, fighting, fighting to make his presence known in her midst again. For Zion, any adornment or trappings put upon her that are not him, are merely a cosmetic attempt to cover imperfections without any hope of true transformation. The Spirit's residence alone makes a parched place beautiful. It's no coincidence that Jesus on the cross said, I thirst. Check this out. This is mighty. This is beautiful. In order to make Zion what it is, in order for us to be able to gather here today under the banner of his presence, and getting to experience his presence. He himself had to become that parched place where the presence of God was absent. The presence of heaven left him on the cross, and that's what made it a parched place. The hill of Golgotha was a parched place that Jesus went up to and became thirst, became sin, so that you and I could be restored to what it means to function and to live and have our being in his presence. That's fascinating to me. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, 1 Peter 2, 24. Secondly, Zion calls out to him because he calls out to her. God is so jealous for his people today. God is so jealous. We see this in Psalm 132, God longing for rest. It's fascinating to me that in creating the natural order of things, his primary intention was not only to show off his creative power and glory, but to fashion something that would host his presence because he desired relationship. He desired relationship. The question I ask is, is God lonely? No. 
but he's good. He's generous, and he knows how good he is, and he knows there's a whole nother depth to his goodness when it's experienced by those undeserving of it. And that's what he wants to share. He wants to occupy your life. Do you know, do you know Christ wants to so take up residence in your world that he is invited into every corner and every arena and every room of your life? because he cares about relationship with you. He's a God of communion and intimacy. The fact that he desires to dwell in you shows his inexpressible value that he places on your life. Number three, in Zion, the matter of an altar is settled. There's form and there's function, right? We can call ourselves the church and or we can function as the church. The form is we might look like the church. The function is his presence possesses us and gives us the ability and the power to function as the body of Christ. There's, there's form and there's function. Listen, in Zion, the matter of an altar is settled. Let me just read you some things here. We're not coming to a religious service here. We're coming to an altar. It's a big difference. A religious service will comfort you, entertain you, tell you to just calm down, be conservative. Just let the team do their thing and get fed and go home, live another normal week. That's Listen, I've lived there. I've lived there, but the Holy Spirit's stirring something way deeper in his people. An altar demands that you become a sacrifice so that fire can come. Fire does not come unless there's a sacrifice. And you cannot sacrifice for someone else. You cannot share your oil with the five virgins that are running low. It just doesn't. I can't. Let me live complacent and lackadaisical and then, uh, oh, give me your anointing at the very end. No way. You have to come and lay down your life as a sacrifice unto God, and he will touch your life with the fire of his presence. That's what happens at an altar. So that's what we expect here. That's what we anticipate. That's what we make room for. We're not going to settle down on that thing. We're not going to settle for church to just be normal or be okay or comfortable or, okay, that was a nice, pleasant service. No, we want to walk out of here at the end of a Sunday and be like, I don't know what happened, but something's different in me today. Like, I don't know what just went on. I, I don't have a theological grid for that yet. Was that sermon heresy? Was that weird, magical stuff going on? Watch and pray. Watch and pray. The goal of this place, the goal of this place is with ever-increasing intensity and accountability to come alongside each other and say, come on, let's go get oil. Come on. Let's go get oil. And if your lamp's filled with oil, go, go pray for somebody else who needs oil and say, Lord, get them, get them, get them, get them. Get them, get them, get them. You're not safe here. You're not. You're not. Please hear me. This is a safe and loving place for you to learn what it means to become a living sacrifice. All right? It's a safe place to learn. But if it's been a year and you still haven't learned, it's going to start getting dangerous for you. We are, we're living sacrifices, holy and pleasing. What, what else are you? You're, you're not a Christian who gets to keep your Christian, Christianity or faith at bay and set boundaries for it and control it. My Christianity looks like this. My interpretation of the Bible looks like this. I'm a conservative Palestinian so-and-so, whatever. It's like... 
There's no denomination here. There's no denomination. This is an altar where we want to know Jesus and we want to worship him as living sacrifices and keep it that simple and never complicate it more than that. We are Christians in love with him. We are followers of Christ. We are disciples. Disciples. We are saints of the Most High God. We are kings and priests unto him. It says in this psalm, I will clothe my priests with salvation. You are priests unto God who are wearing the garments of salvation. You've been given the right and the power and the authority to release the salvation of heaven wherever you go. It says it in the word of God. It says it in the word of God. And do you know what I've learned? Do you know what I've learned and I'm learning? How do I get more of the salvation of the Lord to come off of my life? I have to first allow the depth and the fullness of his salvation to influence me in every way before it can come out. How do you become a priest with the Lord's salvation anointing you? Give yourself completely to the salvation of the Lord. And the salvation of the Lord is not just so you can be born again. The salvation of the Lord is so that you can have communion with God and be radiant with his glory. This is an altar. This is a place of sacrifice, and thank God we don't have to pay for a pigeon and sacrifice a pigeon at this place and then clean up the mess afterwards. It's interesting. Jesus wasn't even sacrificed yet, but he came into the temple and prophetically drove out all those selling and buying pigeons. Because his presence showed up now. The sacrifice had showed up to take care of sin. Once and for all, a bird's not going to do it anymore. All the more reason for us to come because the one true sacrifice has been sacrificed at the altar in heaven by which no man has made by human hands. And now we get to come to this altar every Sunday, Wednesday, or every other day, or whatever it looks like, and we get to give ourselves as a sacrifice knowing that we will never have to hang on that cross. He did it. What, what's, what's the sacrifice looking like? It's, it, looks, it looks like you understanding the depth of love the Father has revealed on the cross for you, and you can't hold back your thanks. And you run to him and you say, Lord, I'm going to spend the next hour just thanking you, praising you, magnifying you, loving you, not letting my week overwhelm my mind, not letting my other desires overwhelm my love for you, but getting right with you right here, confessing, repenting, allowing you to sift me, teach me, rebuke me, exhort me, prune me. Lord, have your way in me because I'm a sacrifice. I don't belong to myself. It's beautiful. It's so simple. It's so good. If you just let go of your life, things will get really good. If you just let go. Heard someone the other day, I'm so scared. I hate my life. It's over. Perfect. (laughs) You hit the most anointed, divine, dead end a human being can hit. Because at the end of this dead end is Christ the King just with his hands out. Give it to me. Give it to me. I'll do something amazing with it. I'll do something amazing with it. Don't worry. I won't keep you too long today. Oh. We have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering and to the assemble of the firstborn who are enrolled. You're enrolled. If you belong to him, you're enrolled in heaven and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. At this altar, you come to worship the one who became sin so you could become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That's why at this place, you might see some people getting a little out of hand. Whoa, don't touch me right now. Don't touch me. I'm overwhelmed with the fire of God. You know what that is? 
I'm overwhelmed by the reality that I've been possessed with righteousness and freed from sin. That's taken a hold of my soul. Whoa, that, that's just amazing. And so through the manifestation of worship, you just lose it a little bit. Not because you're trying to be weird, not because not, not you're trying to be all funky, but your soul, in a moment of revelatory experience and encounter with God, you're overwhelmed. You're like, whoa, whoa. This stuff the Bible talks about is really real. Yes. It's not just a religious book that we recite and then sing through a hymnal and just who and ha and hum and who. We experience the living words of this book because the author of this book joins our fellowship and dwells here. And it, it, listen, and I will never stop believing that or expecting that or anticipating that. It's an altar. Altars have a pulse that attract the Lord's attention. At a stage, you can receive a show that can be shaken but at an altar, you can receive a kingdom that's unshakable. The altar is a place of covenant and intimacy and transformation, but a stage desires numbers where an altar desires intimacy. God's not measuring numbers. He's measuring sacrifices. A successful prayer meeting here is not based on how many show up, but on how many sacrifice their hearts and boldness and vulnerability before the Lord in that prayer meeting. We do this, right? We, we measure the success of ministry for some reason. And hopefully, we start to learn how to measure it in accordance with how the Lord perceives success in ministry. A stage has fans, but an altar has followers. I'm okay to say this because we saw it last week with how Jesus reacted to the temple, but he's disgusted with stages. The Lord is so holy and vehemently disgusted with Christian performance and stages. You know why? Because he's jealous for altars. He is so jealous for altars because he knows what happens at altars. Heaven meets earth. And the ones he love, loves get transformed. A stage promotes the work of man, but altars promote the work of the Spirit. The stage compromises its message because of the fear of man, but the altar speaks the whole truth and nothing but the truth because of the fear of God. The stage is okay with a divided heart, but the altar demands an undivided heart. I'm in this with you. I'm, I'm as unsafe as you. If my heart's divided, the Lord's going to deal with me in love. He's going to shepherd us in love. He's going to meet with us. He's going to help us. The serpent is worshipped at the stage, but the lion of the tribe of Judah is worshipped at the altar. How do you know the serpent's worshipped at a stage? Because there's restraints on that worship. There's an overwhelming intimidation by what's on the news or what's felt in the culture, and so that intimidation leaks into the worship and snuffs it out a little bit. But when you come to an altar where you worship the lion of the tribe of Judah, you're not scared of anything other than holding back the praise that is due to him. If there's one good, healthy concern you should have, it's am I holding back any glory that belongs to the Lord? I don't want to be guilty of that, Lord. The stage needs noise and visual support to masquerade as power, but the altar can be still, quiet, humble, and reverent in order to know the touch and the whisper of the master in the most gentle of ways. The stage will tickle you and leave you wiggling with all of your problems undealt with, but the altar will cut you open and give you a new heart and fix you and transform you if you will allow him to. If you will allow him to. This is when Christianity started to change for me. I, I, I don't know about you, but when I started saying, Lord, cut me open, transform me, whoo, it started getting good. Started getting good. Oh, show me. Oh, there's sin there still. Oh, God, show me. 
Woo, cut it open. Do it, Lord, have your way. Have your way because his knife bleeds with love. He doesn't make any cut upon your soul that's not necessary in order to make you more free and happy and joyful in him. So I, we're not here to get tickled. Listen, we're, we're not here to be these charismatic, prophetic, spontaneous, revival, fire Christians and just act like we're being tickled and we're just feeling good with God. No, we're here, we're here genuinely and legitimately willing to be transformed into the likeness of the Son. We're, we're here to let him transform us. Listen, I'm here to get jealous. I'm here to rub shoulders with you and see Jesus more in you than he's in me so that I get jealous and I go home and pray and say, Lord, do that in me. Take me to the depths of that transformation. I want to outrun one another in the faith. Not just catch up or you're done. No, I'm up here, man. Let me help you. Let me show you what the Lord did for my life so you can get up here with me. I want faith in this house to be so stirred that we get a holy, holy divine jealousy for one another. Not a bad one. Hear me out here. I'm, I'm talking about divine, reformed, restored jealousy under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. At the altar, the efforts and talents of man will not be tolerated. God is not concerned or looking for the efforts or talents of man. I can prove this to you. Exodus 20, verse 25, he says to Moses, If you make me an altar of stone, you shall not build it of hewn stones. For if you weld your tool on it, you profane it. Whoa. So good. That's, that's the Climax of this message. Just get that. Lord says, if you build me an altar, because it is my desire for you to build a place where I am worshipped, you have to use natural stones that have not been cut by man. Performance profanes what is sacred. Our ability and our talent is not needed in order for there to be a house of the Lord or a house of prayer built. We have to come to what hasn't been touched by hands. What is that? Who is that? That's the Holy Spirit. Yeah. That's the chief cornerstone. We allow him to build this altar through the supernatural involvement of the Holy Spirit. And then we learn which input to give. And usually our input is this, I surrender. Lord, you don't need my money. The Lord's not after your money here. Even though tithing is a benefit and a resource to your prosperity in him, the Lord's not after your money. He's not after your talents. He's not after your abilities. He's after your heart. Amen. He's after your heart. And if he has your heart, he can shepherd you with how you steward all those other things of your life Amen. so that this holy communion with him stays very sacred and pure. Self-effort surrenders to the Spirit. And in our yielding, we find His anointing. In this psalm, we see in verse 16 that Zion's priests will, will be clothed with salvation and her saints will shout for joy. Do you know that the stage has happy people, but the altar has joyful people? Happiness needs circumstances to be perfect. Happiness needs that same chair, that comfort, that cup of coffee, whatever it is. Joy goes way deeper than that. Your, your morning can be terrible trying to get here. But you get here because, you know, if you can get to the altar, you can have the joy of the Lord regardless of how messy it was trying to get here. Don't, don't even, I don't have time to go into the spiritual warfare of this week for me. I am inadequate. If you measure my life according to the amount of spiritual warfare, I am inadequate to be a minister of the gospel. I have nothing to give in my own strength or resources. Other than the fact that I knew I was coming today not to a stage, but to an altar. And at a stage, I have to be happy. I have to put on a face. I have to look like I got it going on. At an altar, I get to come 
and lay my heart down with you and alongside you and function in the joy of the Lord. And that's what you get to do. You get to be anointed by the joy of the Lord that far surpasses understanding. I'm going to close here soon. Number four, lastly, if Jesus is exalted, Zion's enemies will be put to shame. In this psalm, verses 17 through 18, there I will make a horn to sprout for David. We know who that horn is. That's Christ. If Christ is exalted here, this is what happens. I have prepared a lamp for my anointed. His enemies I will clothe with shame, but on him his crown will shine. By the Spirit causing Jesus to be exalted in our midst, it causes our enemies to be defeated. I I can come to be here with you today knowing that as I'm here, I'm safe and my enemies are getting defeated, regardless of what it looks like this week. I'm not talking about people. People aren't our enemies anymore. It's spirit. It's spiritual stuff. But you can entrust yourself to the Lord and trust yourself to the Lord and he will deal with your enemies. Listen to Isaiah 10, 27. And in that day, his burden will depart from your shoulder and his yoke from your neck and the yoke will be broken because of the fat. The yoke will be broken because of the fat. In other words, because of the oil. Listen, we are in such warfare that we cannot afford to stay outside the presence of God because we cannot afford to not have the oil of his presence leaking upon us. Because the only thing that breaks the power of the warfare that we're in is the fatness and the anointing of the oil of the Lord's presence in our lives. And so we come to receive more oil. We come to say, Lord, fill our lamps with oil. Without the anointing, we're bound. But Zion was destined to become so fattened with the anointing of Jesus that the yoke of the anointing can't hold anymore. Nahum 1.13, and now I will break his yoke from off you and will burst your bonds apart. Do you know how the yoke was broken upon the, the ox? The ox was fed with fat and oil until its neck got so fat from the inside out that it broke the yoke, not from the outside in. The Lord wants to so magnify and exalt exalt himself in you and make you such a big person that the yoke of the enemy, the shackles of the enemy just don't fit on your life anymore. They just don't fit. I remember there was a sin I was struggling with in my life that could not get broken until I got fattened up in the Lord. Every time that temptation would come, we'd just be like, oh my gosh, this thing is heavy, this thing is whatever. And there was like, there, there was a lack of strength to fight it. And then there was this service, an impartation, something in the, in the spirit just happened. And there was this yo, there was this anointing that came, this oil that came. And I got so fat in my awareness of the righteousness of God and how much he loved me that from then on, every time that temptation came, it's like that yoke just didn't fit. It doesn't fit anymore. You're, you, you have the gift and the privilege of fattening yourself in God's presence. From the inside out, so that anything the enemy tries to put on you just won't work anymore. It doesn't fit. He wants to mature himself in you and break the yoke, not from without, but from within. Christ is the hope of glory. Please stand with me. I want to pray. I want to pray. In this sanctuary, we like to be with the Lord afterwards and have ministry time. So what we ask is, if you want to get into conversation and fellowship and, and meet one another and just, and just be, just have fun, then just take it out into the lobby. And in this sanctuary, let's, let's stay with the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And I want to have time where if you, if you want to be prayed for today, our ministry team is going to come up soon to this altar. 
And if there's anything you need prayer for, infirmity, sickness, any slavery, any bondage, any, anything heavy on your soul, we want to minister to you today at this altar after I pray. Let me pray for us. Jesus, we thank you that you went up to the hill to that parched place called Golgotha to transform a place of death into a place that now gushes forth the spring of life. Thank you for breaking down the dividing wall of hostility so that we could do more than play church, but so that we could come and find friendship with God. We trust and anticipate that with ever-increasing dominion, your anointing will surge as we make it our pursuit to love you. May this altar in this place bring you pleasure. And may this altar in this place possess the pulse of heaven. May it be that at this altar, it's the manifestation and fragrance of Jesus that becomes preeminent. We love you. We choose you. And we say yes again to you today. In Jesus' name, you may be dismissed. Ministry team, can you come forward to the altar and be available for prayer? For those of you who want to love on Jesus and you have children. Oh, thank you, Chris. I forgot, man. Let's do it. Let's do communion. Hey, if you, if you have to go, if you have to get your kids, I understand. But let's have a moment of communion. Um, as, a, as a moment of celebration with him, just I invite you to come up right now. Grab the elements and we're going to pray. You are more than welcome to get your kids if you take communion with your family and have them participate. Jesus, we celebrate you in this fellowship today. Jesus, we celebrate your strength. We celebrate your presence. We celebrate your love. Jesus, we give thanks that in communion we are healed. We give thanks that in communion our strength and or our weakness and limitations yield to your strength. I don't want to assume that everybody in this room knows the Lord. But seriously, if, 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 if you didn't get a chance at tomorrow and your life was to be over tonight, do you know that you'd be with him in paradise? There is a hell. There is eternal separation from God. A, a just, holy, loving God has to allow the choice to reject him. And that place of rejection is called hell and he's not there. And he made a way for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. If you do not know Jesus today, if you have not surrendered your life to him and said, you are Lord, I confess I'm a sinner before you, save me, deliver me. If you haven't done that today, I'm gonna ask you to stand up and raise your hand and get saved today. I cannot bear the responsibility of stewarding this house knowing there's people going to hell. Not gonna do it. Not in my job description. Do you know the Lord? If there's anybody in here who is uncertain on whether or not you know the Lord, please stand and raise your hand and we will come and pray with you. We will care for you. And we will help you find him. Holy Spirit, I assume that everybody in this house knows you to an extent. And so we as a family celebrate the work of the cross. We celebrate the victory of what happened in your death and resurrection. Just, just lift your communion in your hands. 
If you need healing in your body or you have a family member that needs healing in their body, say, Jesus, heal us. We receive. Jesus, deliver us. We receive. And if there's sin, you need to get right with God and say, Lord, I'm done with this thing. I am sorry. Forgive me of this sin. The Lord says he will wash you 70 times 7. He will wash you. He will wash you. If you don't feel clean today, confess your sins before the Lord and say, Lord, today in this communion, I receive your cleansing love and I say, forgive me, Lord. In Jesus' name, receive the communion of the Lord. good thing, even though it might feel like service is ending or worship at the altar is ending, we're coming back this Wednesday night for corporate prayer. And Wednesday nights are beautiful because the mic is open to cry out for the Lord and to pray for one another and anoint one another and to be here for one another. There's an invitation to fast for three days. We we do this at the beginning of every month, Monday through Wednesday. We invite you to fast with us at the discretion of of your faith and what the Holy Spirit speaks to you. It's not an obligation. It's an invitation. And if you've never fasted before and you want counsel on that first, that's fine. There's a lot we, we could say about fasting, but please come on Wednesday night and pray with us, regardless of whether or not you fast. The Lord loves you. It's an invitation to pray, to call upon his name, and to love on him. 6 p.m. Wednesday night, we will be fasting and praying for the overall, for the overall well-being of this church, for the overall victory and the success of the Lord in every facet of this house. In Jesus' name. So if you, if you would like to be prayed for, come on up to the front and you can be prayed for with our ministry team. Bless you today. We love you, Jesus.